Okay, so Corbin Reef. Am I saying your, your last name correctly? Tell me how you say it. Corbin Reef. Yeah, like Coral Reef is the easiest okay. way to, to go with yeah. it. <laughs> well, thanks for um, taking your time to talk to us today. Uh, we're going to talk to you about your, uh, your new book about the one and only Chris Cornell from Soundgarden and multiple other little uh, musical enterprises. Um, but first of all, I want to know a little bit about you. Um, can you tell me uh, what, what music first resonated with you early on, on a, on a deeper level rather than just kind of background radio? Sure. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I think everything stems kind of from my love of Led Zeppelin a little bit. You know, I was a, um, a teenager. I just moved to California when I was like a teenager from Texas. Didn't really know anybody. My, my uncle had a big, big giant backyard and it was kind of my job to, to, to mow it. And uh, he, for some reason, amongst all these Brooks and Dunn CDs and, and Alan Jackson and stuff, he had a copy of the song remains the same, uh, the double disc CD and, it was a big backyard and I had to listen to a, like, you know, a, lo a lot of music to, to kind of get through the mowing process and, and days to confuse, pull out of love and, and no quarter and stairway to heaven were, uh, were loud songs you could hear above the roar of the engine and they lasted a long time. So I didn't forget skipping the different songs. I could just kind of let it ride. Right. And uh, ever since then, like, yeah, I've just been really in love with, you know, um, uh, loud, aggressive blues based rock roots music. And that's kind of was kind of my entryway to that. So when did you, how old were you when you first moved to Seattle, did you say? I moved to Seattle later, actually, in, in life. You know, I was in the Army for a while, and I got stationed at um, Joint Base Lewis-McChord, uh, which is around Tacoma area, a little south of Seattle. And uh, I just loved it so much here that when, you know, once I got out of the Army, I, I went to Iraq and everything, I, I decided to go to Evergreen State College in Olympia. Right. And I just love the area. You know, it just really, really resonated with me. I love the, the, the music that comes here. I love the atmosphere, the people. It's just a, it's a great place to live. So that was what year um, when you when you actually moved that? Must have been two thousand eight or nine or so. Oh, okay, so yeah, a long time after the uh, the grunge explosion for the much of them. yeah much <laughs> later. <laughs> so were you following that from uh, from afar, like like I was, like I was. Um, I mean, I I started out as. I was already a Mother Love Bone fan way before I'd ever heard of Mookie Blaylock or Pearl Jam um, and Soundgarden from very early on. I saw them on the Loud and the Love Tour. Um, but I was in England, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm British. Sure. So uh, it, was, it was another world for me. Was it a similar, similar thing for you? Uh, yeah, it was. Well, firstly, that tour, was that with, with uh, Voivod and Faith No More on that one? Oh, I can't even remember who was who was opening up. My my memory is a little bit cloudy. I just remember <laughs> you know, I still have the ticket, but it only has that uh, one. Yeah, that's a good time to catch them. That's just about the time they graduated from van to bus. You know, so it's a good era. Uh, no, I think my my experience is sort of similar. You know, watching them from afar, like you know, the Black Hole Sun video uh, was kind of the first kind of my first actual like vivid memory of of Soundgarden was that was that video with the wide smiles and Chris standing there as the fans blowing against him and the world seems to be ending you know when you're kind of a a young person that leaves a really vivid mark on your imagination and ever since then i was just kind of like what are these guys about and you know like i said getting into like zeppelin and stuff they were they were more in that mold than sort of the other groups that kind of came out of seattle speaking of soundgarden that is yeah. um i was kind of i was kind of thought of nirvana as sort of like the beatles with the hooks and, and the pop melodies uh, even though the aesthetic doesn't match up and and, uh, you know, with the aggressive live act and loud sound, Pearl Jam kind of struck me as the who. But then you kind of get into Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin territory with, with Soundgarden. And, and man, that's the sweet spot for me, you know. So I was always uh, drawn to them. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. Because even though the whole thing was kind of labeled grunge, and I know a lot of people that were involved in that scene didn't really like that word at all. Um, Soundgarden seemed to be on the outside of that whole thing just a little bit. They were always name checked in the list of grunge bands, but it felt like they they didn't really fit in completely. How do you how do you feel Chris um, felt about that that whole labeling and the whole explosion and the scene that became that came out of that? 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting to to kind of ruminate on that because, you know, when you when you look at what the scene was and what it ended up becoming, you know, like to the outside world, those are two kind of vastly different things. Soundgarden was kind of always at the center of it um, from the beginning. There was this compilation of, of bands that came out around 1986 or so uh, put out by this label called CZ Records, and it's called Deep Six. And Soundgarden was one of the bands on there. Um, Green River was one of the bands on there, which had, you know, um, uh, uh, Mark Arm, Stone Gosser, Jeff Amen. Uh, Malfunction was one of the bands on there who had Andrew Wood. Yeah. Uh, Skin Yard was, had Jack and Dino and Matt Cameron. And there were just all these guys that were just on this one album, even though they weren't in their famous bands yet. It's like Soundgarden accepting, you know, they hadn't formed Pearl Jam or Mud Honey or, or Mother Love Bone, but they were kind of all there and they were, they were all friends uh, first, even though their tastes were different and, um, you know, what they kind of ended up doing was different. It was a very specific localized group of friends that formed different bands together. And, and it, it was just kind of this local way of like getting music in Seattle because it's so isolated from the other parts of the country that if you wanted to experience live music in the city, you kind of had to make it yourself because touring bands didn't want to drive from Minneapolis. They didn't want to drive from San Francisco to up to Seattle because you're missing a lot of markets along the way and you're wasting a lot of gas money. So it became isolated in, in, in that regard. But to go to your point, um, Soundgarden sound was vastly different from a lot of those other bands. It started off kind of post-punk indie with the Screaming Life EP kind of went more into the dirgy stuff with Ultra Mega OK before becoming more lacerating with Bad Motor Finger and La Louder Than Love and then getting psychedelic. There was this kind of evolution, but it was apart from what their their contemporaries were doing. But but that's kind of what made the scene so dynamic is that there was all these different interests, but but they were drawn together as friends to make music. Do you get did you get any sense of how we? I mean. At one point, I think there was a whole fashion line that was inspired by the grunge, <laughs> which was kind of anti-fashion in its essence. You know, did you get any sense of how Chris felt about how that, that little Seattle scene kind of took over America for a while and became yeah. horribly hip? <laughs> yeah, I think that everyone, there's a, there's a, there's a chapter in the book that, that's called Swinging on the Flippity Flop. Um, and there was a little bit of an absurdist view that the people in Seattle took of, you know, how the rest of the world interpreted, you know, what they were doing. And Swinging on the Flippity Flop was a, as a, as a name that Megan Jasper, the CEO of Sub Pop Records, um, she just said some names in the New York Times about what the local lingo was around here, making just some bullshit up, you know, just some fake, fake names. And, and the Seattle, the, sorry, the New York Times ran with it as this completely on the on the level accounting of what people in Seattle actually spoke like, and they ran this whole article of it, and then they had to issue like a, a th like a statement saying this wasn't real. And yeah, there was this element of it being taken over by the cultural forces, and you know, charging five hundred dollars for a flannel T-shirt and you know, baggy <laughs> jeans and stuff. And it, for the people involved in it, all they could do was just kind of shake their head and and, and pro you know not and not protest about it, but you know, laugh at, laugh and make fun of of the things that were going around them because they were you know, deeply earnest people in a lot of ways. You know, I think that's what kind of made the music resonate so much is that when you look at someone like Chris or Kurt or Eddie or Lane or Jerry or Kim, like you didn't get the sense that these people were pretending to be anything except for who they were. And for other people to kind of co-opt that authentic, those, these, these authentic people for a purpose that was commercial, it just, uh, it, the, Chris sometimes said he felt like he was living through a cartoon life. That was kind of the way he, the, the phrase he used. And it, you can definitely understand how you'd come to feel that way. Yeah, for sure. So moving on to the book a little bit, what, what was your, when you decided that you were going to write this book? And I think it was immediately after Chris's death, correct? It was shortly after. I wouldn't say immediately, but yeah, yeah, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was shortly after. What was, what was your, like, you, you could have gone a few different ways with what you wanted to include and what you wanted to leave out. What was your initial um, kind of viewpoint on how you wanted this, the finished book? Yeah, what, definitely. That's, a, that's a great question. You know, um, after Chris passed, um, you know, I, I looked around, like my editor was the one who had the idea and, you know, I kind of held off for a little bit, you know, cause it was, it was soon and his death really, it affected me in a, in a real, obviously I wrote a book about him and it affected me in a real profound way just because he just seemed like the kind of guy who, you know, he was so strong and powerful. He had that voice and he had so much going for him. He'd recently reunited with Audio Slave and did the Temple the Dog reunion, was on the road with Soundgarden. It, and it was just so unexpected. I just didn't see it coming. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I made, 
I paid my respects to his, his final resting place. And I thought, decided to kind of think about it some more and agreed to do it. And when I decided to do it, one thing that kind of propelled me to take on this project was I looked around and there was books about grunge. There was books about Nirvana. There was books about Pearl Jam. There was books about the Northwest music scene. And except for like one book that had been written about Soundgarden back in like 1997, there just really wasn't anything about, about Chris or that band that was kind of out there that kind of told that full story of, you know, what they did in, in their career and what Chris did throughout his life. Yeah. And I felt like th that, that record was missing. And so when I was thinking about, you know, writing the book, I really kind of wrote the book about, you know, what I would want to learn about Chris Cornell. And, and, and for me as a music journalist, that was always going to be the music first. I mean, his life was an extraordinary life and there was a lot of, uh, extraordinary circumstances that, you know, that he, he processed throughout his life. But the reason why we love Chris Cornell, the reason why we love artists like him is because of the music they make that enhances the moments in our own lives. Um, it's an empathetic voice you can go to when you're feeling down or happy or, um, you know, it's depressed or anxious or euphoric. There's, they're, they're, they're kind of always, that music, the fell on black days, pretty, you know, uh, black hole sun, like that, those songs are always there for you to kind of revisit. So, when I thought about the most, you know, interesting portions of, of Chris, you know, I, I wanted to kind of get into what kind of artist he was and why he made the art that he did. And that's kind of where I kind of let, let myself go when I was, when I was writing this project. Yeah. So after you decided you were going to do it, what were the first steps that you kind of took to um, start getting the, the information together? Yeah, the first steps were obviously reaching out to as many people that knew Chris as I could and, and try to interview as many of those people as I could and interview dozens of people. And I interviewed Kim Thiel when I was, when I was writing the book for a piece for Rolling Stone that I did and right. reached out to some other people and uh, did, did, did as much, many firsthand original interviews as I could. Artist the Spoon Man, Mark Arm from Mud, Mud Honey, uh, just a bunch of people who knew Chris and worked with him and, and loved him in life to try to accumulate as much original information as I could. But then as I thought about it, you know, I realized that, you know, as much as I was telling Chris's story as the writer, I wanted Chris to be able to tell his own story because he wouldn't get that chance. Mm. So I dug through literally every scrap of interviews I could find that he'd ever given, you know, with on video, uh, in old zines that I kind of had to look up in the Seattle Public Library, um, the Oral History Project the, the, with the Museum of Popular Culture here in Seattle, just uh, Seattle Times archives, every, every interview I think Chris gave in his life, I think I've read at this point, just so that I could include his perspectives on things and what he was thinking at different points in his life. So that as people read it and they are, are following along with his process and, and the things that are happening to him, they can understand what was going on in his own mind to the, to the extent that I was able to kind of let them into that uh, headspace. And I, I know, I believe that you did contact family and um, band members about being more involved in the book. Did you ever get any explanation as to why they chose not to? Yeah, you know, I think for, it's, it's everyone, everyone had kind of different circumstances. You know, for some people, it was just too soon. You know, Chris had only, it's still only been about three years since Chris had passed. And for a lot of people, that's just, he had such a, he made such an, a gigantic impact on so many people's lives. And so many people really loved him. And for me as a biographer, you know, I always tried to remain conscious of that, that, you know, as much as I was writing about, you know, this rock god on stage that so many people adored throughout the world, I was also writing about, about a real human being who had real family members, real friends that, you know, had a real, you know, stake in his, his life. And for some people, they just weren't ready. And other people, you know, there was, there was some other issues kind of going on outside the book project, you know, with, with, legally speaking things and you know it just wasn't a time they felt like going on the record and that was something i had to respect too and you know i just did the best i could to kind of overcome that yeah so now that the book's out and i'm sure you're glad it's finally out <laughs> definitely uh, what kind of feedback have you had from people who actually knew him well uh so from most of what i've heard has been pretty positive i've been very very happy to you know kind of i i kind of I don't want to give away the ending, but I didn't frame the story as a tragedy. I, I don't think, I mean, it ended tragically. It obviously, it ended very tragically. But Chris's story, I think, to me, isn't a tragedy. You know, for someone to come out of nowhere in the Pacific Northwest, that part of the country, you know, that no one really cared about. You know, he didn't graduate high school. He was working at a, you know, a, you know, a restaurant. He just this blue-collar guy who really had no visions, you know, at, at a young age that he would become anything like that he became. And and to 
to make art that impacted so many people across the world, to see so much of the world, to meet the Queen of England, I mean, after writing the James Bond theme yeah. song. Um, I mean, to, to play at the, the, the first Black President's inaugural uh, uh, ceremony in, in 2012, you know, those are incredible things. I mean, and it's an incredible life that he led. And I just hope that I'm glad to have known that as the feedback I'm getting is that a lot of people are understanding that, that even though there was a bad end and it was tragic and we'll always wonder, you know, to some extent, you know, what could have been different or what might have changed or anything like that, that, you know, he, he led an amazing life and helped a lot of people along the way. Yeah. Cause it's, I think, I think you're right to say that um, it's important that we look back on his achievements and his lifetime rather than how everything ended, which was kind of the big, news story at the time um and i'm sure you would, would agree that e even though a lot of people remember chris as this extraordinary singer that nobody really like sounded like at all i think he he was quite underrated as a songwriter um and i think your book is gonna is gonna kind of help people realize just how talented he was and how varied he could be as a songwriter as well. Would you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the interesting things is that when, when Soundgarden started, you know, uh, it originally started as a three piece with him on drums, uh, Kim Thiel playing guitar and here, young Moto on bass and to go from like a Husker du situation where you've got a singing drummer to then learning kind of to play guitar while he's in Soundgarden, taking tips from Kim Thiel and, um, kind of honing his craft to the point where then, you know, by the time Bad Motor Finger rolls around, you know, six years later, he's playing in altered tunings, different time signatures, writing these really vivid self-exploratory lyrics, looking California, feeling Minnesota on Outshined. It's a small lyric, but it says so much in that. And there's so much power in the succinctness of that, of that lyric. And, and really it was just hard work and elbow grease. You know, he had a natural gift for singing, obviously, you know, you can't, there's certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. And, and to reach four octaves, you kind of have to have that ability, but as a songwriter, he really, really worked hard throughout the years to perfect that craft and taking new tips from people. Um, and, and working to, to I kind of always change his style, like bad motor finger, uh, to kind of use an example, sounds so much different from the other albums that Soundgarden put out because they were working on these specific set of tunings like Open C or whatever it was. And then go to Super Unknown and it's totally different. It's, you know, it's psychedelic, it's moodier, it's not as abrasive. But, but that's a kind of reflection of, you know, what he was kind of, what he was kind of doing in life and the interests and, and the different things that he was thinking about. You know, when, when he was making Super Unknown, Michael Beinhorn, the producer, you know, was, was asking him like, what kind of music do you want to make? Because he was making all these songs that he thought he was making for Soundgarden fans, really metal -y. And he's like, I really like the Beatles and Cream. And so Beinhorn said, make music that sounds like the Beatles and Cream then. And then he did. And then we get 4th of July and Fell on Black Days and, and you know, just all these incredible, Mailman, all these incredible songs. And then I work with Timbaland later on the Scream album. And they went yeah. with a hip hop producer. And, just, and then after that, to do, a, to, to do an acoustic sort of, album he was just all across the board and took different chances where maybe other people would have been more conservative but he chose not to do that yeah and um you mentioned the timberland project which um i think not everybody loved shall we say um but do you think it was it was just something that he had to do and he had to kind of see where that would would take him as a as an artist um or do you think like some people would, were accusing him of kind of selling out and trying to get into the pop world. Which way do you I think that, I think that he was just a person, especially with this, his solo albums are really interesting because they don't sound like each other at all. And they don't sound like anything that he did otherwise in life. Hmm. I mean, Euphoria Morning is very moody, um, but kind of has this ethereal quality to it. Carry On with Steve Lillie White is very um, adult contemporary. Scream is obviously very hip hop um, influenced, and then Carry On, or sorry, uh, uh, Higher Truth, is um, is very like folky almost. And and it, I always kind of see his I, as I was writing the book, I kind of looked at his solo albums as these weird, interesting detours where you know he got really fascinated with a certain idea or a certain aesthetic and decided to pr pursue it, you know, with his own name attached to it rather than try to bring in a band element and and mm -hmm. and kind of you know fit himself into a framework that might be more conducive to a certain sound and I don't know 
there might, there's obviously some level of calculation that goes into any dis business decision making and you can't discount that. But I really feel like when I was doing research about it and interviewing some of the engineers and producers that worked on that Scream album, it just seemed like he was really interested in getting something new a shot. Yeah, for sure. I would, I would completely agree. And, um, and even if it doesn't always work out, sometimes it can lead on to something that does work out and you have to have that process, right? Unfortunately, absolutely, uh, it has to kind of be in public <laughs> to a certain extent. With mm. it. Um, but I have, I have no problem with that. And um, I, I, I found yeah. it interesting, even, even if I wasn't completely sold as a fan. So, and then you might uh, incur the wrath of Trent Reznor along the way, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't talk too much about that one. Because uh, <laughs> I, know, I know what happened with him and Trent. Um, so if, if, you would, if somebody didn't really know him as a songwriter and you wanted to play one song for them and just say, listen to this as an example of how good a songwriter he was, is there one song that springs to mind? Wow, that's great. That's a really great question. You know, um, <laughs> that's tough. You know, kind of going back to his chameleonic nature to some extent. You know, there's there's so many different facets of his of his of his songwriting and so many different elements in the way he kind of worked and 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 in his different band environments too. That it's it's that's a tough question. Um, I'll, I'll I, can I give a different one for the different sort of a, a in, a sort of incarnations of Chris Cornell. So I'll give you yeah, my, sure. my, yeah. So like solo, I think you got to go with Seasons, uh, the song yeah. that he wrote for the single soundtrack. It's just yeah. so dark and brooding and whimsical and acoustic, and it's just like the best of Led Zeppelin three. But it's just fantastic song. Um, Temple of the Dog. I would go the song Call Me a Dog. Um, I just, the way, if you want to know what, what Chris Cornell was all about as a song, like a singer, that song kind of has it all to me. It starts with this really like great croon. And then before he blasts off into that, like the stratosphere with the, right before Mike and Creedy's guitar solo, it's just, it's so dynamic. Um, Soundgarden wise, I have to say 4th of July off of Super Unknown. Okay. Uh, there's, no, there's no song to me that's just as, it just sounds like a vivid waking nightmare of, of epic proportions. Like even more than Black Hole Sun sounds like, like the apocalypse because of, of, the, of the music video. Like that song, it's so dirgy and, and like everything that's great about Soundgarden. It's loud, dirgy and black and just fantastic. And then Audio Slave, um, I'm going to go with Shadow on the Sun because I just think that song fucking rocks. <laughs> <laughs> And we haven't talked too much about Audio Slave yet. What do you think? I mean, obviously, Rage Against the Machine was long done at that point. Um, Soundgarden was, well, it was done really. I know it was kind of technically on hiatus looking back, but um, what do you think he wanted to get out of the Audio Slave project that he, he wasn't getting anywhere else? Yeah, you know, I think he was just looking for an interesting sort of next step after his first solo album. You know, he, he did that record with the, the group Eleven, you know, Natasha and, and Alan Johannes. And, um, you know, he was kind of figuring out next steps. And just all of a sudden, one day, Rick Rubin and Tom Morello came knocking on his door. And, you know, Rick Rubin had played the Rage Against the Machine guys, the song Slaves and Bulldozers, when they were kind of trying to figure out what they were going to do next uh, right. after Zach De La Roca had kind of left the band. And, and when that song filled the room, it was just like a light bulb went off. And it's like, oh, we should get Chris Cornell. And so they, they went out there and had all this enthusiasm. And, and he, was, he had some reservations because they had been such a political band and they had a reputation for mayhem. But, you know, I think that he saw it as, a, as an interesting opportunity that came along his way and it's something that dynamic that he could process. And, and his one stipulation was he didn't want to play guitar in that band, especially at least for the first record. He wanted to leave the guitar duties to, to Tom Morello and, I think he just saw it as a different a new challenge and a uh, new experience that even if, you know, critics ended up not liking it at the time, I think Pitchfork gave that first album a 1.6, which is just, I mean, how do you do something like that? It's just an amazing record. Um, it was just out of 10? 1.6 out of 10. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like a stone, shadow in the sun, getaway car, Cochise, come on. One point. Anyway, I, I, I yeah. Anyway, so. You think, yeah. was, you think that was partly, I think around that time, the whole super group thing, that's like there was some bad stuff coming out that would, would technically be called super groups. And this was another super group. Do you think that was just people not taking it as seriously as they should have? 
one thousand percent. It was some. It was the people were smelling the contrivance uh, in the air about that band, and I think that they were kind of quick to to tag them as you know lesser than their other groups right out of the box. I mean, being compared against Rage Against the Machine and Soundgarden is a is a tough tough mantle to try to lift, and I think they did a really good job of kind of overcoming that. Uh, and history has kind of proven that you know they were onto something. I mean, they don't sound like either of those new two bands. And um, they became their own unit. And those three albums are, are really, really solid. The first one's, uh, I think, a, a masterpiece. But the other two, uh, Revelations and Out of Exile, are really, really fantastic. Yeah, and then obviously he had his, his solo work, Temple of the Dog, we mentioned. Um, I was lucky enough to get to see them at Madison Square Garden. Oh, nice. Um, and then he did the, the Timberland thing. He did the James Bond thing. He always seemed to be like almost almost up for anything that um he felt he felt comfortable with or even maybe a little uncomfortable do you feel he had goals or dreams that he never actually got to achieve did you get any sense of what he might have done next that's a really interesting question i um it's really weird as you kind of look back at near the end of his life um you know, he he just recently done that Temple of the Dog reunion after the Mad Season reunion kind of at Ben Royal Hall here in Seattle. And um, then he kind of reunited with, you know, Soundgarden a few years before he was on tour with Soundgarden. Um, and then also had reunited with Audio Slave for the anti-inaugural ball shortly after Donald Trump was elected. So he, he kind of went on this weird tour of his life near kind of the last two years there, playing with the different bands that he'd been in. And, you know... Um, I, he was still making music and he was still doing soundtrack work. He loved to do soundtrack work. He did a lot of uh, songs for different ventures. It, it just seemed like we're going to miss this whole sort of mature looking back era of Chris Cornell that we kind of didn't get to see, you know, um, someone ruminating on their life kind of in the way that, you know, Springsteen or Tom Petty did or Springsteen and, and, uh, and his one of his heroes, Johnny Cash did, especially, you know, with, with Rick Rubin later, you know, there's this whole era of, you know, maybe sort of American recordings with Chris Cornell just on a guitar and, and his voice that we kind of didn't get to to live through. And I kind of lament that a little bit because, you know, you give that guy a guitar and, and just his voice. And, and as he proved on the songbook tour, there's there's no way he couldn't hold someone's imagination. And, and to see what he might have been able to do in that arena would have been really cool. Yeah. And on a, on a personal note, are there, are there any songs that jump to mind that, when you hear them, they take you back to like a particular moment in your own life. Oh man, <laughs> there are. I mean, there's there's so many. I think that I listened to. I, I well, when I was in Iraq, <laughs> I, I had Outshine as my uh, my alarm every morning. <laughs> so oh. every morning when I woke up, when I was in Iraq, I listened to Outshine. That was a uh, that that comes to mind for sure. I, for me though, when I think of Chris. Um, I was, I was at that mad season reunion in Benaroya Hall and I'll just never forget that image of him like cocking his head, like to the, to the side microphone in hand. And just, if you get like that, that last line before Mike McCready kind of explodes with that guitar solo, if you give me a leash, then I'll drag you along. I just, that image is just burned in my memory so vividly that it, it just, I don't think I'll ever get that one off my mind. And it kind of carried through when I was thinking about him as a performer and writing about that, writing about him in the book, just, being in the room when he unleashes it with that kind of force and power is something that it just stays with you forever. Yeah, for sure. And, and how did you feel about the tribute concert um, after he died? Were there any standout moments for you in that? Oh, wow. Yeah, that was, that was fantastic. I, I went um, to that and just, I, I loved, I, I met so many people there that I didn't know or I kind of tangentially knew or, and I ran into so many people and introduced myself and, and just, the amount of love that was in that room from the fans and appreciation from the fans just to be there and, and to experience these music, this music one more time, maybe, maybe for the last time uh, presented in a sort of way. It was, it was very real and all the performers on stage did such an amazing job, but to uh, Miley Cyrus honestly did a, did a fantastic job. She's a great singer. I agree. Uh, I she just, she everybody by surprise. I think a lot of people originally wouldn't have thought she even, deserved to be there and then when she sang everybody had to eat their own words i think yeah miley cyrus um you know brandy carlisle was another one who brought the house down with, with chris stapleton on hunger strike and, and then she got to do black hole sun too which is 
kind of goes to show you the esteem that the Soundgarden guys have for Brandy Carlisle. There was, there was no bum notes that night. Opening with the Melvins was kind of perfect because, you know, the, the Melvins had opened for the Soundgarden so many times before. And um, getting Audio Slave with, with uh, Geezer Butler on bass, you know, just – there was just so many just unbelievable moments throughout that show that I think that anybody who was there will carry those memories for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I agree. So um, one last question. If Chris was around today and you got to ask him one question – what would you want to ask him? Oh, oh man, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. It's man, that's a tough one. You know, um, I'm sure you can stick with him all day asking questions. But if is I know, I know, I know that you just yeah, need, this is, need answered. I mean, obviously. Well, but so, uh, let's leave let's leave the big. I mean, obviously, the, the big question is 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 a big is you know the last question is is the big question. But I don't want to. I would want to ask yeah. that. I guess yeah, I would ask. I like that if he was if he was around today, if he was still here, and you got the one. Sure. Question. You know, I, I, Bad Motor Finger is my favorite Soundgarden album. It probably is my favorite Chris Cornell album. And I know that he took a writing trip to out to the coast of Washington, this place called Kalalock, uh, and just kind of sat in a cabin by himself for ten days. And I just would love to know more about his writing process for that album and how he isolated himself, like why he decided to isolate himself. But besides, he just had, he brought a Pomeranian around with him and, and just wrote songs, bang, banged his head against the wall. And I would just love to know, like, what was going through his mind in that cabin when he wrote, you know, the, the words to Drawing Flies. And, and, and when I was doing the research for that book, that, that particular section really grasped my imagination. And I would love to, to know more about how he wrote and how he operated during that particular time in his life. Mm. Because he was actually affected a lot by world events too. The Gulf War was happening. He, he's kind of stopped driving a little bit. So he was riding his bike like 30 miles to the studio every day. And just, you know, it was just a really weird, interesting time for him. And I, I would love to have learned more about, uh, you know, what was going through his head in that era. Great. Well, congratulations on the book. I'm glad um, it happened. Uh, I think it is long overdue. Um, and good luck with your, uh, your future endeavors. Do you have anything planned? I got some stuff in the works. I'm not ready to reveal anything yet, but yeah, definitely got some things going, cooking on. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter to see all the developments just at Corbin Reef. Uh, yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast talking about Chris Cornell. Yeah. Yeah. For me too. I've always been a big fan. I saw him, uh, I saw him live a few times with Soundgarden, with Temple of the Dog, um, and a couple of times solo. So I never got to see Audio Slave, but, um, but that's, uh, that's my only, re only regret. So, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for the book, and thanks for your time, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks, Colby. Take care. Right. Bye.